it was about five, six years ago. I'm not sure uh, what the actual uh, time frame is, but it's been a while. When I went through a series on spiritual gifts, but I didn't do it in the church. I did it for an alumni conference. And I have referenced that alumni conference quite a few times, and Nathan had to break it to me on the side. It's like, I think we're missing that. We can't seem to find it. And so it's like this obscure part of uh, Ellerslie history where I invested this huge amount of time into this series, and it's been sort of something that I can just sort of say, yeah, go to that and listen to that, and that'll say it. However, it's a weird thing to point at something that doesn't exist, right? And so I felt it's about time that we rekindle that meditation so then I can point at it. And I can say, there it is. Now, uh, this is a very, very difficult topic. When I just say spiritual gifts, it stirs various things in a mixed body like ours because we are a blended body denominationally and we have different heritage uh, root systems that cause us to have different frames or reference points or mindsets towards the Holy Spirit and towards the anticipated working of the Holy Spirit in our midst. There's some that would prefer, well, not, probably not here, but there are some in the body that would prefer never to mention the Holy Spirit. Like we are safer as the body of Christ and we will be healthier if we just ignore the Holy Spirit because when you start focusing on the Holy Spirit or give him any time and attention, then weird things begin to happen in the body of Christ. And there are some that would probably be on the exact opposite end of the spectrum that get upset that Eric Ludi doesn't address the matters of the Holy Spirit more and that some of the functionality as seen in the early church should be real here and at a lot more uh, vital level than they are. And so I usually end up disappointing everyone. Uh, all extremes usually get frustrated with Eric because I usually end up neither on, on either side, and I'm always trying to cut the middle. And the point that I am always bringing up is the centerpiece of Christianity isn't something like spiritual gifts or the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us to make something else the center. That's what's ironic. The Holy Spirit would never make himself the center. That would violate his entire job description, which is to reveal to us the person of Jesus Christ. And so when we have a church that is functioning as it ought to function, it doesn't go to extremes on either side. It always stays to the center and emphasizes the person of Jesus and what Jesus did on that cross. And that becomes the rallying point for all of us. Now, in so doing, we still have these truths. How do you address the Holy Spirit? Because to ignore the Holy Spirit is a crime within the church of Jesus Christ because he is the functional power of the working body. And so to ignore him and to act like he doesn't exist as if that's a way of securing our health, it's the surest way to break down our health. But to overemphasize anything in scripture leads to the same breakdown. And so to find that balance in every theme and every topic we bring up is a challenge. And so this is, I'm just going to lay it on the table to start with. I, I'm headed into a series here. That's, that's the goal. It's a five-part series, which I'm always scared to announce the, um, how many parts are in something, lest I end up cutting one out or adding one later. So I don't know why I just gave a number. That, that's a very bad idea for Eric to do. But at least that's how, what I have mapped out right now is five parts. And in going through this, I, I am tackling something that I would say has to rank up there as one of the most difficult topics in Scripture. But I want to take time to unpack it instead of trying to cram it into one message. I don't, as many of you know, I don't typically go through sermon series, which is weird. Because I'm probably one of the only pastors on earth that doesn't. It's not a normal thing for me to do. And yet I feel burdened to do exactly that in this situation. is to, to cover this ground that I think could work to bring us together as a body to give us a common vision as a body, to give us an understanding of how we are built spiritually and uniquely to complement one another. And so there's, this is territory that I can't say that I don't have a, a bit of trembling uh, when it comes to uh, attempting to go in this direction, but at the same time, I have a great deal of expectancy and desire to head in this direction. So let's uh, begin. Uh, 
we would begin if, uh, there it is. Uh, so doing the twist. So all of my, uh, my sessions are gonna have the same uh, cover slide for them with a different title. This first one is called Doing the Twist, which sounds a little like uh, you know, a dance maneuver. And yet this isn't a dance maneuver. This is, uh, this is a play on words to talk about something that we all have a propensity to do. And especially when it comes to issues around spiritual gifts, and that is to slightly twist uh, what Paul intends, and it leads to all sorts of hazards. So we'll call it doing the twist, and this is part one in the series. Kinesiology, the study of the mechanics of body movements. So some of you are familiar with kinesiology. It's, it's a science, and it's a science of studying the body and how our body moves. And it's a very interesting science, and it's, it's also fascinating because it's, it's a two-year degree. And I know you could say, why is that fascinating? Because in Christianity, we have a science about body movement, body function, but very few of us have ever invested two years in learning how the body functions. Isn't that an interesting thought just in and of itself? People can get a degree in kinesiology and be excellent with the physical body, but very, very few of us have ever spent the time to learn how the spiritual body is intended to work. And yet we have a tremendous amount of content in the scriptures. In fact, I would say a surprising amount of content in the scriptures on this very topic. And yet that content just happens to be rather confusing. So I get it. I understand why some of us sort of uh, shy away from the topic because it is rather challenging. It seems even contradictory at times. And as a result, it becomes one of those topics that is just easier, maybe left off to the side. I don't really want to get a degree in kinesiology. And that's what this would be, spiritual kinesiology. The study of the supernatural mechanics of the body of Christ. And I would say, Paul the Apostle was definitely a kinesiologist, a spiritual one. He understood the makeup of the body, the, the, the mechanics of the body in a beautiful and profound way, and is going to, in each of his letters, stick this understanding in. That doesn't mean that we are easily able to glean what Paul intended us to see and understand. In fact, for most of us, if we just started getting out all our knowledge on this topic, you would recognize that some of it doesn't seem to jive together. And I'm going to walk through that, and that's part of the whole purpose of this series, is to really begin to put these things together in a working model as opposed to just a theoretically confusing one. So the two-year degree, mastering the physical mechanics of bodily movement. Could you imagine if we actually got a degree? Now, five sermons is probably not enough to give us a degree in spiritual kinesiology, but it's better than what most people have, right? This topic is not an easy one. Each of the New Testament letters discusses this movement and coordination of the body of Christ, and yet in just reading the text, we still are left a bit perplexed. For instance, Paul has five distinct lists in which he defines different mechanical functions and movements that should be expected in a healthy body. But each of these lists is different. Doesn't that bother you? For those of you that like exactitude, it's really frustrating. It's like Paul, okay, here's another list from Paul. So this one should match what he says in this letter. Instead, it's completely different with like maybe one similarity. And that is tricky for those of us that like to create a taxonomy and we like to organize everything into its parts. Paul doesn't seem as motivated to do that. He seems to be speaking from a different angle in each of these letters, and it's sort of up to us to allow the Spirit of God to lead us through this to say, here is what he was talking about, instead of trying to have a prepackaged analysis of it. 2 Peter 3, 15 through 16. This will give you a lot more understanding. Imagine the early church dealing with these letters and trying to figure out what Paul was up to and what he meant by it. And there's already some discussions going back and forth and people are already dividing over this. This is what Peter says. Our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist 
to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. It is a propensity for us as humans to twist what God has revealed. It's the Spirit of God who trains us to rightly handle and not twist the Word of God. But it's in a strange way encouraging to me to realize that the early church was struggling with the same things that we struggle with. And that is that they were vulnerable to twisting what Paul was saying. And that Peter himself is saying that what Paul is writing is actually hard to understand. Doesn't that encourage you? A little for those of you that read it and you're like, I don't get this. Does everyone else just get this? There's certain things that I'm going to cover that really are rather confusing. If all, that's all you have is that little passage, passage, it would be like, I have no idea what he's talking about. Praise God, we don't just have that one little clip of Scripture. We have the entirety of Scripture in which to understand it. So this is at Ellerslie one of the things that we will start with. Uh, just to give a, an understanding of how we approach the Word of God. And I think it's important as we begin this series to just freshly see this idea and to understand it. I call it the three positions on the word. So if we were to take the scriptures, that text, and we were to say, how do we relate to it? And I would say, well, there's three different options or orientations towards it that we could have. The first, which is a very, very common one in the church today, and I'm sad to say that it's common in the church today, but that is that we come at an angle from above it, and we move the spectacles to the end of our nose, and we look down on the Word of God, and we critique it. It's like, well, the poor text, it doesn't really understand how to handle our modern times, and it really doesn't give us a correct answer to this, so I will supply the correct answer instead. And so that is approaching the Word of God as if you, in a strange way, are superior to it in intellect and in understanding. It is a very, very dangerous orientation to take towards the text of Scripture. And I think all of us in here are just horrified that anyone would have that because one of the gathering points that we have is on this. We don't really talk about it all the time, but one of the things that bonds us together is our orientation towards the Word of God. And so that's why we can be from different denominational backgrounds, but gather together with strength because we all approach the Word of God in a similar fashion. And for most of us, I would say, if not all of us, it is not from above it. And in fact, that's horrifying to us to think that anyone would look down and think themselves superior to God's Word. Oh, that's horrifying. The second option is one that I'm going to say all of us in here are vulnerable to. It does not mean we're functioning it, but we're vulnerable because we, many of us, have grown up with the second option. And I'm going to call that beside where the Word of God becomes a buddy. He becomes a chum. He becomes a friend. And so we hang out with him, and we have fun with him. We throw the Frisbee with him, and and so we have a sleepover with him. And in other words, we really like him, and we have a respect for him, but there's something about a chum or a buddy or a friend that is different than the proper way to agree with Scripture. And that is, imagine your friend is hanging out with you, and and he hears your mom say, you know, honey, you need to clean your room. And then you're, you're, you know, you're downstairs playing in your room and your friend says something like, clean your room. You're like, excuse me? You're my buddy. You don't tell me what to do. You see, a friend doesn't command. A friend can appeal, but a friend can't command. It's like, I really think you maybe should listen to your mom. That's something a friend could say, but a friend can't say, clean your room. He has no authority to do that. And many of us have a relationship with the Word of God where we love its text. We appreciate being around it. And we esteem it. But it does not have command authority in our life. Because we approach it as one that is equal to us in this journey. Sort of like a helper along the way to just sort of comfort us in the journey as opposed to a king of kings and a lord of lords. Option three, it is above us. And option three, when we start discipleship at Ellerslie, I'm always going to say, the way we approach the scriptures here at Ellerslie is we are beneath it. The person getting up here and holding the microphone has to start with the premise that the word of God is greater than them. And you, even as an audience, need to remember that the speaker is beneath the word. So you need to measure and test 
everything that the person with the microphone says against something that is greater than them. So all of us are submitting to that text. We are recognizing that that text is correct even if our own minds can't comprehend it and if we don't understand it in the moment. We still believe that it is correct. When you take Paul's words and you measure them against political correctness today, if you are beside or above the word, you could easily sneer at it and go, boy, Paul didn't know what he was writing there. That could really get him into hot water. Well, believe it or not, what he wrote back 2,000 years ago got him in hot water. In other words, it was politically incorrect back then as well. Paul knew what he was writing, and he was writing in agreement with the Holy Spirit, and it's the revelation that God himself has said, this is my message. And so when we humble ourselves and put it above us, and we submit to it, then sound reasoning can come. But when we begin to look at it as if we are superior, or as a modern culture, we know more, that is when we get into trouble. Acts 17, 11. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, speaking of the church at Berea, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Even if it was Paul speaking to them, they still tested Paul against the text of scripture. So I'm going to say the crux of the confusion on spiritual gifts is an issue of what I'm going to call capitalization. Capital G and lowercase g. And I've done this for many other key themes and truths throughout the uh, time that I've taught at Ellerslie. But when you capitalize something, it is a big deal. Like, for instance, one of the il illustrations I've given is fatherhood. I am a father, and that's a very significant position in my kids' lives. However, as a father, I am not the capital F father. That's God. He's capital F father. I am a lowercase f father that does not diminish my importance or my role. However, if I, as a father, capitalize my F, you know, that sounded funny, but in my fatherhood, and I make myself bigger in my children's lives than God intended me to be, what happens? I end up abusing the authority that I have in their life and not leading them to the capital F, but actually leading them to me as the final say. It's a delicate balance because my fatherhood should be respected, right? And I do have an authority, but how that plays out, there is a balance. And if I capitalize myself in that, I distort my parenting. The same thing is true here. We have the word gifts. Typically in the Greek, this is going to be the word charisma, which you're going to recognize the word charis or grace in it. It is a grace impartation. So the Spirit of God is going to give grace to each one of us to function as the body of Christ, this charisma. However, when you handle that in the wrong way and overblow that, which has happened in our modern day, for instance, the term prophet, okay, that's actually in Scripture in the New Testament. It's a really awkward word for us to know how to deal with, right? And so what we have a tendency to do, well, I'm not saying we, but what has happened in the modern church is that we are capitalizing the P in prophet. And it's just like, well, this prophet is no different than the Old Testament prophets. There are churches out there that have these prophets today that are actually giving revelation that is superior in their mind to the text of Scripture. Do you see a problem there? In other words, what we have done is we have capitalized something that was never meant to be capitalized. The same has happened with apostles. So now they're on par with Peter and Paul, modern day. And as a result, they are shaping the message of the church instead of the scriptures shaping the message of the church. And these are distortions that come in when you create a capital G instead of keep it where God intended it, which is a lowercase g. It's valuable. It has tremendous import. But it was never meant to take on a role that was established already by the Holy Spirit and by his text that he revealed. That job is already taken. We are not looking for new workers to come in and be the Holy Spirit and the text of Scripture. And yet that is precisely what has happened because something has been capitalized. 
So I'm going to give three C lenses. Now, my third one, if you skip down to the bottom, you're going to recognize it's actually an S, but I made it a C. You can make it something a soft C, uh, and that helps me get three Cs in here. But I'm going to say the first lens is, and these are all lenses that we're probably familiar with, okay? And if you're not familiar with these, it's not going to harm you if you don't know about these things. It's just very common today. I'm going to call the first one the charismatic lens. The charismatic movement is going to be the ones that are going to emphasize the charisma. They are on to something. They see something in Scripture, and they believe that God wants to work in a mighty way in the body of Christ. Good. That's excellent. However, in a sense, what they've done over the years is capitalized the G, and as a result have distorted the idea of the Holy Spirit governing the body of Christ. I'm not going to say that everything under the charismatic side is wrong in saying that. I'm saying it has this vulnerability that many of us have shied away from. The cessationist lens. This is the one that loves to arrive in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and remove all the working of the Holy Spirit in the modern church. It's like, oh, that's all over and done. That ceased. And so that's what cessationism is. So the cessationist lens, I always look at it as the ultimate cop-out. Because you know that you can save yourself a lot of problems in, as a student of the New Testament if you, just have, if you just believe cessationism? Oh, well, that makes it so easy. All of this difficult stuff that Paul writes... I don't even need to worry about it now because that ceased. Oh, that ceased too. Well, that is a convenient theology. And so as a result, you're going to recognize I am not going to take that position, not that I don't understand that position and long for that position at times because it would make things a lot easier if I could just say, at this point in time, none of this exists anymore. And that would be such a cut and dry answer to all that Paul writes. And then we have the third lens, the simplitist lens. Now, I know that's spelled incorrectly for those of you that are sort of concerned about my spelling on that. I spelled it with a C just to keep my three C's going here. But I made it, I had a sermon quite a while ago. It got me in a little hot water. I'll just be honest about that. It was called the simplitist. And I, I was joking because someone had asked Paul Washer if he was a Calvinist. And he said that he was a you know, five-point Spurgeonist. I chuckled at that, you know, it's the ultimate way around that question. And then, you know, so I said, so if you asked me the same question, I'd, I'd call myself a five-point stud, which I thought really was funny. Uh, but I was talking about CT stud, and I said, my five points are Jesus, 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 and Jesus. You want to understand salvation? I'm going to give you my five points. Well, that, that sounded like I was, you know, disrespecting and disregarding Christian history where there's been great debates over this exact point, and I was oversimplifying it, okay? That wasn't my point. At the same time, it sort of was, because I'm not looking to debate with someone around soteriology and the five points of Arminianism or Calvinism. I want to get right down to brass tacks of what salvation comes from, and it's a person. You could know five points of Calvinism and Arminianism and go to hell, that isn't what saves you. It's a person that saves you, and his name is Jesus. And so my passion here on this platform has always been that, and that's, I called it a simplitist. That was my made-up name. I was joking when I said it, and boy, did people run wild with that. Eric calls himself a simple-minded man. You know, it's like, well, great. Uh, what have I awakened here? And yet, okay, I will embrace that. That's Paul's term of talking about the simplicity that is in Christ, which means the singularity of focus. Paul is saying that his desire is to keep the church singularly focused on Jesus and him crucified. This is Paul's great message. This is Paul's great working. Everything he is going to teach is going to flow out of that center, which is why I battle here in this ministry to actually say, let's remember what matters most. So a foray into the book of 1 Corinthians. So I have covered 1 Corinthians multiple times, but 1 Corinthians just happens to be what I would say arguably the center of the battle when it comes to this issue of spiritual gifts, but not just spiritual gifts. I would say almost every denomination finds their root system in 1 Corinthians. I mean, it is bizarre how controversial of a book 1 Corinthians is. And what is ironic about that is the whole book was written to deal with the division and the controversy in the church of Jesus Christ. 
Do you guys see an irony there? In other words, most de- denominations find their root system with a scripture reference in 1 Corinthians, which I would say is the word of God. You're correct. However, do you know the context to that? Paul was correcting the fact that we were dividing over that. Isn't that ironic? Here he is starting out 1 Corinthians, which I'm going to go into, and he's saying, guys, we have divisions among us. This ought not to be. And then he goes into writing this book to try and bring the church together. Instead, all of us 2,000 years ago are you know, cherry-picking and finding some really good scriptures to support our position for division. That ought not to be. And so as a result, to deal with spiritual gifts, we sort of need to go to one of the key zones of Scripture which lays out the position of Paul towards this thing called the function of the body of Christ that in Corinth was a mess. And I see no reason why we would want to be like the church at Corinth. I think we want to be the exact opposite of the church at Corinth and actually listen to Paul's letter and do what they were not doing, which is being unified and utilizing the grace gifts that we were given to strengthen one another instead of divide from one another. So this is a journey into the book of 1 Corinthians. First, is Paul confused? That is a really good question. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the entire book. And if you were not a student of Scripture, and if you were a cynic of Scripture, you could very quickly think that Paul has lost his mind. Okay? Now, I'll go through this with you. Just a second. I lost my spot here. Is Paul confused? A quick peek at some highlights from 1 Corinthians might cause someone to think so. So, Paul says, all things are permissible to me. All things are lawful for me. Now, by the way, I'm taking these things out of context so that I can show you how Paul can look confused. He does say that, right? He also says this, remove from your midst the fornicator for what he is doing is not permissible and lawful. Doesn't it look like Paul has a double standard there? All things are permissible and lawful for me. Hey, remove this guy. What he is doing is not permissible and lawful. It's not a big deal to eat food sacrificed to idols. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, for those of you that know the context of those, you could understand, right? But if you don't, that seems like a double standard. It seems like he's confused in the brain. Do not judge. I judge your behavior even though I'm not with you. Don't get married. Marriage is fine. Prophecy is passing away. Seek to prophesy. When a woman prophesies, hey, don't let a woman speak. A woman ought to have her head covered. If you've you've ever read through this passage, it's one of the most confusing processes, right? Because it says a woman ought to have her head covered at the very last conclusion. Now, I don't believe he actually means we have no such practice in the church. However, there is no better escape clause that you could have from dealing with head coverings than that one line. It's like, well, they have no such practice in the church. Well, then why did Paul write all of that? And yet, it does seem confused. Speaking in tongues is empty and of no value. I speak in tongues more than you all. You ought to relate one unto the other in absolute purity. And while you're at it, greet each other with a kiss. You should agree with one another. If you don't agree with me, you're wrong. Context, context, context. So for those of you that are familiar with the terrain of 1 Corinthians, that's a very humorous list, but it's also very true. Like everything I just said is actually there, and it could seem like the guy is totally off his rocker and confused. Paul is not confused. What he is saying is very lucid. And it's a very, very strong argument that he has in 1 Corinthians. However, like I said, many of us have cherry-picked 1 Corinthians. It's very common to denominationally back your position by going into 1 Corinthians and finding your little section and lifting it out. For instance, and I've used this illustration before, 1 Corinthians 11, which is head coverings, and then 1 Corinthians 14, which is tongues and prophecy. 
usually those that gravitate towards head coverings do not gravitate towards 1 Corinthians 14. And those that gravitate towards 1 Corinthians 14 do not gravitate towards 1 Corinthians 11. Yet what is their argument? This is what the Bible says, and you're not doing it in the church. And you could use that crossways to both of them. It's only three chapters apart. The same argument if used would really indict the other party, right? In 1 Corinthians 11, when a woman prophesies, it makes it very clear contextually that when she, when you prophesy, I don't know if you use words to do it. However, typically someone would speak. And so a woman, when she speaks, ought to have her head covered. And then in 1 Corinthians 14, a woman ought not to speak. What? Well, if you understand the context, you recognize the difference between the function of the body in a, in a situation like this, like a service like this, and the government of a, of a church. They're different. And so when we try and do what we oftentimes do in 1 Corinthians, we actually mix things up and create confusion, which we could blame Paul for that, or we could blame ourselves for not rightly dividing the word of scripture, because Paul is not confused. So every word must be interpreted in the light of its sentence, and every sentence must be interpreted in light of its paragraph, and every paragraph must be interpreted in light of its chapter, and every chapter must be interpreted in light of the entire book. And I want to add one more for those of you that are experts in the idea of context. And every book must be interpreted in light of the entire Bible and in light of the nature of God as revealed throughout the text of Scripture. In other words, there's a reason why God gave us 66 books. And so you could handle contextually one book just right, but you need to also recognize it's in a whole. God put it in a context of 65 other books. Corinth, the church splattered with controversy. I've joked many times that many of us are asking God to return us to the you know, first century church form, and we need to add to our prayer, but Lord, spare us from being the church at Corinth. Because the church at Corinth is a first century church, and it was a disaster area, which could encourage us. <laughs> However, we need to remember that when we approach the book, that Paul is writing a disciplinary letter to a church that is marred with controversy, contentions, and divisions. And he's not happy. And it's interesting that we would go to that book, which is a correction book, and find it as the source of all our reasons to divide. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul shares his reason for writing. The author and the audience. Paul, this is 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 2, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sothenes, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Sounds like I'm missing something here. However, it's written to the saints of God. That is one thing we know. It's not just written to some apostate group. It is written to those that call themselves saints. The primary motive for writing. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 11. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. So now remember which book we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a book that has been the sponsor of most denominations, if not all denominations, that exist today. And Paul, in his entire premise, is pleading with the brethren, with the saints, with the believers of Christ, that they all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among them, but that they be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me, says Paul, concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So what are the contentions? You guys ready for quite the list? This is, there's not just one contention at Corinth. There's not just two contentions at Corinth. I mean, I could keep making numbers. There's a lot of contentions at Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13. But at the core of those contentions is right here. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? What really matters? What is this Christian thing all about? 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 24. So here's Paul attempting to start 
centering this church. We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. We live in a time period that I would say is very similar. We have the same human propensity, and we have a tendency to identify ourselves with teachings. We have a tendency to identify ourselves with men. We have a tendency to identify ourselves with movements, and the key for a Christian is that we identify ourselves with Christ. And that's a tricky one because I understand why we do what we do. Because we have to clarify, I am not with that, I am with this. Because there are distortions that will enter in. And so to clarify that I'm not with that distortion, I join, identif- identify with the group that is anti that distortion. And we have a tendency to build these up like barnacles around the church, which is how denominations actually are fostered, to help clarify what we are not. And so even though we start out with what we are, we have a tendency to clarify over time what we are not. And so you'll see that happening in politics all the time. Politics are are, are sort of like all that we see in 1 Corinthians with the veneer taken off, because they're not trying to act like they're Christian. Right? They're just living as humans live. And they will create camps and then subcamps and divisions. And there's always a division right down the middle. Right? There's always two sides in the most basic sense. And the two sides are at enmity with each other. And throughout history, you can study this. It's always that way. And yet, what we have a tendency to do is get caught up in the fervor of the social mixture. So as Christians... We identify with the conservative camp, at least in here, right? And we would, I mean, we don't even talk politics in here, but I know you well enough to know that you are not leaning in the liberal side because the liberal side, that is demonic, that is satanic. I mean, you could fill in the blank with a whole bunch of other adjectives to describe it, right? And what we have a tendency to do is the same thing that every other human does, which is to dehumanize our opponents. When in actuality, as believers, did you know that those opponents are actually the very people you are to go out and love? Isn't that an irony that the very ones that we are being preconditioned, even in the church, to hate and to resolutely stand against and to spit in their eye if they're ever in near us, we have been commissioned by the Spirit of God to love them. And to lay down our life to see them rescued. It's what missions work is. We are not called first and foremost to be responsible citizens. We are called first and foremost to be responsible Christians. Isn't that an interesting statement? First and foremost, we are Christians. We are believers. We are not looking to spit in the eye of anyone. We are looking to win them to Jesus Christ. And when these barnacles begin to build around us, it creates division points even amongst us. So if we start playing the political game in here, then we will have subcamps here. And we'll have those that are, you know, anti-vaccine and those that are pro-vaccine. Or we'll have some other split on guns control. You know, it's like, well, you have the pro-gun control, and then you have those that, you know, don't really know anything about guns, and then you have those that are very anti-gun. See, we then find sub-splits within a split. And I'm saying that isn't Christianity. That is not what makes Christianity Christianity. You're going to have a tough time going to the scriptures and figuring out God's position on gun control. We have our conservative position, which is reasoned, and of course as conservatives we're going to say it's reasoned from scripture and personal responsibility, and hey, you don't tax me, I I choose to be taxed. We have our conclusions, and believe me, I know all those conclusions, and I think those conclusions too. It's not that they're absent in my brain. I think them too, and I I have a vision of what a healthy government would be. But we need to not divide over the wrong things. We need to unite over the right thing. Pastor Paul has his hands full with Corinth. They're contentious and denominationally minded, making every peripheral doctrinal theme a dividing point while forgetting the doctrinal theme that is most important. I don't know if you've ever been in a church like this. It's very unhealthy, and it's very unhappy. 
And yet, when you are dividing within the body of Christ over your peripheral doctrines, you feel very righteous. And you feel very good about yourself for doing it because you're contending for the faith once given. And this is the delusion that can so easily swallow us up as we divide over the wrong things and create division in God's precious body. And as a result, rule number one of kinesiology is violated. We're supposed to function as one. Could you imagine if your right foot revolted against your body and said, you stink, oh body, and it wants to do its own thing? The human body must function in integrity and unity. Integrity is the idea of one. It is one. It functions with one. If the mind says, I'm going to live this way, the mouth declares this, then the hand agrees, and it does precisely what the mind and the mouth declare. The heart agrees, and this body functions in agreement with what is being declared and what the head is deciding. That's a functional body. And if you don't function that way, the body breaks down. And Paul is going to link us as a body. He's going to create that grand metaphor for us to absorb and to think on. You are the body of Christ. And so when there's divisions among you, we can't be functional, guys. Are you noticing that in Corinth? This isn't working. Let me tell you how it ought to work. They're arrogant and puffed up thinking they are immune to correction and are free to live out their Christianity any way they see fit. This was a huge movement in Corinth. Now, there were two sides to Corinth, just to be honest. There was a side that had gone liberal, that actually was not submitting to the Word of God, and had discovered something known as liberty, liberty in Christ. And so as a result, I can throw off all restraint. I have been set free from this law. I can live any way I want. Hmm, that sounds familiar. And then the other side, which prefers law and doesn't want that liberty, in fact, spurns this liberty as licentiousness, but actually wants to have all of the Christian life figured out and taxonomized and broken down into the most granular rules so that you would not become like the world, like these guys are. And so you have the hyper-legalists in Corinth, and you have the hyper uh, licentious ones. And I mean, how those two can get along in a church? Well, they can't. And so Paul is dealing with a mess in Corinth. Controlled by the flesh, they're babes. They're carnal and controlled by self's passion for comfort, control, and recognition. They were sexually immoral, exercising their quote-unquote liberty in Christ in a manner that feels good to them, though it may harm others. They were aggressively separating from all sinners the world over. Isn't this funny? This two, the, both these groups are in the same church. And so there's this other group that, is, that feels that they cannot be touched by anyone that is sinful. So they're separating from anyone that has any mark of sin upon them. So they're hyper eager just to please God out of distancing from all that is sexually immoral. So you have the sexually immoral in Corinth and you have those that are hypersensitive to separate from all that is sexually immoral. They're taking each other to court, allowing the secular world to make decision in regard to the church. They're eating food sacrificed to idols, enjoying liberty at the expense of another's conscience. Their unwillingness to give up anything, or there I should, should probably write it, they're, they were unwilling to give up anything. Their rights, why should I give up my rights? Their earthly pleasures, their possessions, and their control over their life. It's like, no, this is mine. Yeah, I believed in Jesus, but this is still my stuff. Refusing to cover the head properly, showing shocking disrespect and dishonor toward their God-given authority. Now, in 1 Corinthians 11, you see an actual physical head cover. And this is obviously a debate, and many of you have come from uh, even maybe Mennonite backgrounds, and so you can understand the tensions on this. However, back in that time, to not wear a head covering, there was only one kind of woman that didn't wear a head covering, and that was a prostitute. And so you are disregarding and dishonoring your head or your husband by not having that on your head. And the woman's like, but I have freedom and liberty in Christ Jesus, which is the truth. However, you don't have freedom to show unlove and disrespect and disregard. You were not set free to live any way you want. You were set free to show Jesus. And as a result, you are misusing your liberty. 
handling communion with utter disregard to the preciousness and sacredness of it, diminishing the value of the shed blood of Jesus. Chaotic and disorderly in their use of spiritual gifts. Aha, we landed uh, somewhere that, uh, that affects our message. Remember this, out of control tongue talking and prophesying. Maybe not the problem we've had in this particular church. Ironically, I have been in churches where that fits very well. And, but it is a lack of understanding that Paul is going to touch on. It's like they have very real things. They have liberty in Christ Jesus, but they still have responsibility to live and to resemble Jesus. Both sides have a truth, but they are distorting it. And there is supposed to be a submission to authority still. That, didn't dis that isn't gone now that Christ has come, is that suddenly all authority is, is absent. And they have been given grace gifts, and they have been empowered to function as the body of Christ, but they are using them in their own, according to their own whims instead of being harnessed according to the Spirit's purposes. Women jumping ahead of the men, dishonor and disrespect, undermining God's clearly appointed leadership. Audacious question of the resurrection. After all, it's preposterous to think that people can rise from the dead, right? So this was all happening in Corinth. And now I don't know if you can see a lot of the denominational barriers that we even have today already spurting up as far as what divides the church into camps. The two ditches in the center line. I've gone through this multiple times over the years when I'm trying to showcase how the church divides, how culture divides. It's on these two fronts in, their, in the main sense. The first side is what we're going to call the liberty ditch, and I'm going to stick that over on this side, my left, your right. And it's just a little to the left, so since it's my left, I'm going this direction. And so ironically, when you call someone a leftist, uh, or when you talk about our governmental system and politics, the left are the liberals. They're going to be in the liberty ditch side. That's the way I would describe it. In other words, where they're going to say, hey, I have freedoms, I don't like these restraints, I don't like these rules, I don't like these inhibitions, I want to live any way that I feel I should. This morality that is you know, coming from over on this side, I want to throw that off. And so we're gonna, I'm going to call that the Christian Sadducee. Whether or not the Christian Sadducee would appreciate uh, that description, or the Sadducee back in uh, Jesus' time would appreciate that. But the Sadducees were, would have been the liberal-leaning of their group, of, of, of the religious leaders of the day. And then I'm going to go to the other side. We're going to call it the law ditch. I don't know why we all have a propensity towards one of these ditches, but it's like a magnet that pulls us. Very rarely are you pulled in both directions at the same time. We have a propensity, like I would be a classic law ditch guy. Okay, I, I would be a great legalist. And I have been a great legalist at times. Whether we could use the word great in front of it is probably a funny way of saying it. But I have been oppressed with extreme legalism in my life to the point where I didn't even want to go out because I, my conscience was so sensitive. If I ever saw this, I had to respond. I had to say something. And it was like a misery in my soul. I didn't understand the freedom that is found in Christ Jesus. And so I found myself almost like it was a haven where I can be righteous if I just live this way. But I can't live this way. I don't have the capacity. My own righteousness is not sufficient to pass whatever test I think I can pass. So therefore, condemnation was always knocking over here. And so I understand why people jump to this side and go into the different direction. It's like, hey, throw off all weights, throw off all restraint. And I would say I would prefer to not be in any ditch. Because there's a center way, a narrow way that we are supposed to walk in. And the reason a shepherd has that staff, one of the reasons, is to bring comfort. How would that bring comfort? Because as a little woolly uh, creature, we have a tendency to wander one way or the other. And the shepherd taps our backside. And he says, this way. A little more to the left. Oh, well, a little more to the right. And he keeps us in the center. We all, and I, we could have a, a, a fun time, I'm sure, going around and saying which ditch we have a gravitational pull towards, but we all sort of have a gravitational pull away from that which is actually true. And that's why we need help. We need a good shepherd to steer us, to walk us forward so that we don't err on one side or the other. So 1 Corinthians 12, 31 
Paul is going to be looking at these two sides, and he's going to see the splits in Corinth, and he's going to bring it down. He's like, okay, guys, we got the, the liber, liberty guys over here. We got the law of people over here, and it's, this isn't working, is it? And he says, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And that word for excellent, if you've ever heard me teach on that before, hyperbole, which is where we get the word hyperbole, it means something better than hyperbole does in the English language. It is so far beyond. It is such a far-reaching, massively improved answer to a solution. And Paul is going to show a far greater solution that is so outlandishly beyond what liberty or law could gain you, that we think will give us peace. If I just was free from these regulations, if I was free from any standard, oh, if I had a standard, it was totally chronicled for me and I knew exactly what to do. Neither way is where life is. Jesus did not set us free for either of those. He set us free to live in liberty, yes, with understanding of restraint, but governed by the Holy Spirit so that we truly live in a way that fulfills the law, fulfills the commands, but doesn't have the weight of the commands upon our soul, so that we can live with joy and peace. Who wouldn't want that? Paul says, I want to show it to you. I want to show you this more excellent way. So, now I am taking the more excellent way, which is 1 Corinthians 13, which most of us in here have probably memorized at some point in our life, which is love. Paul is going to say the most excellent way is love. And so I'm going to take what Paul says, you know, we could speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but if we have not love, and I'm going to do something with that to show sort of a key idea that I want to unpack today, which is we have a tendency to identify our moving forward with men. For instance, Trumpism is a classic illustration of that today, where we almost find our hope our security, our financial hope, our political hope for this future in a man instead of in Christ. And it will be disillusioning and it will not lead to health. Believe me, you cannot go down that road. Never put that type of stock in any man. We follow a savior who is able to do precisely what he must do to steer the nations where they must go. And so, Though, and I'm going to put, I aggressively defend the doctrines of Peter, but I have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though, I'm putting in, I vigorously argue on behalf of the conclusions of Apollos, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I animately champion the exhortations of Paul, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So we can divide all day long over, you know, all these things of Peter, Apollos, and Paul. However, if you are not motivated, if you are not moved out of this higher law of love, it's empty, it's hollow, and it's meaningless. It profits you nothing. I do not want to live a life that profits nothing. I would say if I could bottle up my great desire in my life is that when I am finished living it, it would have counted for something in the eternals. The thought of living a life that meant nothing is so hollow and so barren. I don't want that. I want to live a life that counts for something in the kingdom of heaven. Where God kindled upon my obedience and changed people around me for eternity. Oh, I crave that. And so this scripture should stir me to the depths of my being and say, oh Lord Jesus I only want this. What is the solution that Paul is talking about? Love. Well, I want to live a life of love. I don't want the false version of just, hey, I'm free to do whatever I want, or hey, I have the law, and I'm dotting every I and crossing every T. I'm living as I ought to live. Both are self-righteousness. Both are a conclusion that is contrary to God's conclusion. God did not set us free for either of those. He set us free for himself. He says, would you come unto me and allow me to move in and allow me to inhabit your life with my Holy Spirit so that the works you do are my works, so that the words you speak are my words, so that the life you live is my life. That is Christianity. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. When one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, 
Are you not carnal? 1 Corinthians 4, 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sake. Listen to this line. That you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written. You're not following men or movements. You're following Jesus Christ and him crucified. That no one of you be puffed up for one against another. The problem in Corinth, they made something other than Jesus Christ the focus. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I have quoted that scripture almost possibly more than any other scripture in all of Ellerslie training because there is Paul talking to a church that is distraught with division, and he is going to give them the clear, what I call the North Star. It's like, guys, you've all been given a compass, but when you pick the wrong North Star and you follow soteriology as your chief North Star, you saw eschatology, as your chief North Star, morality as your chief North, North Star, uh, church attendance as your chief North Star, how long your dress length should be as your chief North Star, whatever your division points are, if you miss the true North Star, it's empty. The whole point of what you've been set free to do is to follow Jesus, to know Jesus, to be found in him. What is all of this? So if we're going to talk about spiritual gifts, the only point of spiritual gifts is to reveal Jesus. The only point. It's not so that you could have a cool gift and you could show it off and have a whole bunch of people impressed with you. That is antagonistic and totally opposite of the entire point of what Jesus Christ is doing. He has set us free to love. And to love means to take the lowest place, to consider others as more important than yourself, to consider others' benefit as more valuable than your benefit. Could you imagine what would happen in the church of Jesus Christ if we actually thought of others more than we thought of ourselves? And, Jesus, and Paul is going to say, this is the most excellent way. This is how you truly change the world in which you live. This is how Corinth could work, is if we actually don't just receive grace from God and then spend it and splurge it on ourselves. But we take that which God gives us and we give it to each other. We share it with each other. We share it with the world around us. And then suddenly this, known as the church of Jesus Christ, transforms. And suddenly this is showing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And this world on the outside sees something that they can't mock. It stuns them. And they have no answer for it because we're washing their feet. We're serving them. We're willing to lay down our life for them. And they don't know what that is because the church they grew up around was self-absorbed. The church they grew up around was anything but impressive. But what Jesus designed the church to be is impressive. The question is, are we willing to do whatever it takes in our generation to get back to the center line? To get back to what truly works? The love Christian, right down the middle. The Christian Christian. If you're going to describe that Christian, because today we have so many Christians, right? Well, that's the liberal Christian, or that's the, the legalistic Christian. I don't want to be either of those. Uh, but I'm lacking an adjective to describe it. So the Christian Christian. The way a Christian was supposed to be right back in the beginning and still is supposed to be today, that's the sort of believer we want to be. Love harnesses liberty. In other words, it's not the absence of liberty. Christ really did set us free so that we are no longer under the law. But it also fulfills the law. It doesn't lead in a way that is contrary to the nature of God. So when he sets you free, he doesn't set you free to live according to the flesh. He sets you free to live according to the Spirit. And the Spirit of God reveals Jesus. Which means you are set free, yes, but to reveal Jesus. To show love, to show kindness, to show care for others. You do reveal purity. You do reveal his holiness. You do show his righteousness. But it's not you manufacturing it under a list of rules. It's you fulfilling it because the Spirit of God is empowering you from within. That's Christianity. It has always been Christianity. 
And only that which flows out of the power of heavenly love is worth anything in the grand landscape of eternity. The anatomy of love, God's nature of humble, selfless giving. A church that is based on that as its premise, if each one of us throughout the week and then when we gather is thinking about each other, it is so hard in a busy world like this not to be thinking about your own stuff. It is. I understand that, but that's the enemy's game. God's, if you could call it game, is to turn us outward. Is to say, well, you trust me with your stuff. But God, my stuff, my stuff needs attention. I know. But will you seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and I will deal with your stuff? That's what he promises. He says, if you turn outward and trust me, I'm going to deal with your stuff. But if all of us are allowing God to deal with our stuff, and we deal with each other's stuff, that's how he solves our stuff. In other words, he, we're meant to work together as a body, the way a hand works with a wrist, and the way the wrist works with the forearm, and the way the forearm works with the elbow, and the, fore, and the elbow works with the, uh, the upper arm. I can't think of it all of a sudden. And then the elbow, and then the elbow, and the shoulder. I need to, my uh, kinesiology lessons are, are dated, and I need to get, uh, you know, reset on all that. However, all of these things are interconnected as we are. And sometimes we try and figure out what part of the body we are because that helps us understand. I don't know how to answer that, but I do know we're part of an organism. And when we turn inward and, and center on ourselves, it actually hinders the body around us. It's a weird thing, sort of like Achan's sin. When Achan thinks of himself, it actually harms all of Israel. And when Achan is dealt with and that problem is removed from the body, suddenly the whole body can function and win. All of us are interconnected. When it says that sexual immorality is a sin against the body, it's an interesting statement because you could say, yeah, it's a sin against the individual body, sure. But it also violates the body corporate. And God wants to turn us outward to recognize our life is not a standalone existence. We are not lone rangers in this thing. We're a part of something. And for many of us, that's very uncomfortable. However, I just want to nip in the bud that idea of our isolation, and I want us to say, what can we do as the body? And that's what this entire series is about. I want to start introducing you to what you have been given so that you can effectively utilize it to impact this body first and foremost. And when this body is functioning, we can't help but change the world out there. But for this to work, there sort of needs to be more than one person that goes, yeah. It's all of us saying, Yes, Lord. And that is something that I would say most of us in this generation haven't tasted at the level that God intends us to taste. And I would like to go after it. John 13, 35. By this all men know that you are my disciples. And then I put dot, dot, dot. Now, most of you know what that is, but I'm just sort of baiting you, just extending it out. There's something that is the obvious evidence that all men will know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. So uh, I'll give the full scripture here. By this, all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. When we start here, and we learn body life here, and we take the grace that God has given us, and we splurge it on each other, instead of just keep it for ourselves, to survive in our own little world of challenge and trial, the world is changed in and through that decision. And we reveal that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus and him crucified, the message that answers every dispute. I have been in many disputes. I have been in many situations where doctrinal truth is in the ascendant and there's a battle over it. I've had, when we've had bigger uh, pastoral teams before uh, WCF uh, was planted on the other side of, of town, we had, I think it was eight pastors, and we would have moments where there were tensions. And they were tensions over very real questions, very real doctrinal points that could divide the church. And at every time, our leadership has always come back to the center and say, oh, let's stop right there. All right, we're not going to be like every other church and divide over something as petty as that. Let's remember what we agree on right now. What is more important than that? It's not to diminish the value of that because that is a very real thing. And you could easily splinter on that. However, let's first unite 
on what we ought to unite on. Let's make sure we're cultivating love unto one another. Now let's bring that up and address it. And when you put it in its proper context, it can never divide the church. You can disagree, but not in a way that hampers the church because we agree on something greater. And when you're agreeing on Jesus and him crucified, it makes it really difficult to allow something like head coverings or baptismal style to divide the church or worship. Should it be contemporary? Should it be hymns? These are things that ironically, even though it sounds pathetic, and it is, divide the church regularly in our day and age. And I would say, let's learn to unite properly. Not on the wrong things. I'm not asking us just to be some ecumenical, ecumenical gathering where we're like, hey, let's look past everything. Yeah, you're not even a believer in Christ, but I will unite with you and be one with you. That isn't how it works. We are believers in Christ Jesus. And we believe that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God. We believe that his work on the cross is, in fact, the work of God on our behalf and is the only means by which a man can be saved. And we believe that that God who came to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ, when he gave his life up on that cross, gave us an avenue of redemption, an avenue of liberty, a means of salvation, that when we believe in him, we can be transformed and set free, and we can have capital L life for all eternity. And we believe that that God-man Jesus rose again on the third day that death could not hold him down, that he proved the fact that he was, in fact, the Son of God, not just by the fact that he gave up his life for us and fulfilled all prophecy, but that he rose from the dead on the third day, just as he said, and that he currently has ascended into the heavenlies and he is seated at the right hand of majesty and all things are beneath his feet and he is returning for us someday soon. We believe We might have subtleties of difference when it comes to a myriad of points underneath that canopy, but we allow love to be our chief function in the body, lest we allow the enemy to splinter us on anything that is not central to the person of Jesus and what he did for us. Because when you go out to give the gospel, I'm guessing you're not going to start with, and by the way, I believe that baptism is supposed to be sprinkled and not immersion. That would be a really poor gospel presentation. The gospel is about a person, and his name is Jesus. And when we are delivering the goods of the kingdom of heaven to a soul here on this earth, we're introducing them to him, not to our sub-petty pet doctrines. I should remove the word petty because some of them do matter. But they are small compared to the capital D doctrine of Jesus and him crucified. Father, to be able to walk in grace, we need grace. We need you to intervene in our lives, to help us shed the traditions of men that have so oftentimes barnacled us and hindered us, that have led to even divisions in our lives. Lord, that we're not sponsored by you, but we're sponsored by our own self-righteousness oftentimes, our own pride. Lord, I pray that we would be marked by love as believers, and that as we walk through this series we would be knit together as the body of Christ. We love you and we trust you, Lord Jesus. It's in the precious name we pray, amen.